Hello, everyone, and welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Doug Fiafia, and I'm a manager on our small business sales engage team within GCS here at Google. Now, first, I'd like to wish everyone a happy Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Before we get started, I want to remind the audience that we will be taking questions towards the end of this talk. And as you think of questions throughout the conversation, please be sure to add them in the live chat on the right. Now, I am very excited to introduce today's guest, Sione Havili. Sione, whose parents originate from the Kingdom of Tonga, was born and raised in Glendale, Utah. His father, Devita, was a bus driver for 38 years, and his mother, Elva, was the CEO of the Havili household, successfully raising eight children. After graduating from high school, Sione signed a letter of intent to play football at Brigham Young University. But prior to enrolling at BYU, he was involved in a retaliation to a drive-by shooting that happened in his neighborhood. He was later convicted of a first-degree felony and served time to pay his debt to society. Upon his release, Sione eventually earned a football scholarship to Texas Tech University, where he graduated with a bachelor's degree in 2005. Siona currently serves as a regional vice president of sales at Domo Incorporated and is also the vice chair of the Utah Polynesian Professionals. He's passionate about helping Pacific Islanders, women, and other underrepresented minorities land breakthrough job opportunities in tech. He's also an advocate in helping convicted felons find meaningful second chance opportunities in the workplace. In October of 2021, an award-winning documentary was produced on his remarkable life story titled Redeemed, the Siona Havili story. He's happily married to his high school sweetheart, Lini Kioa. They have five beautiful children and reside in Sandy, Utah. Now, before we turn the time over to Sione, I do have to mention that Sione and I are cousins. Now, <laughs> one interesting fact about Tonga is that there's actually no word in the Tongan language for cousin, aunt, or uncle. If you are my cousin in the Tongan culture, you are my brother or my sister. If you are my brother's sis brothers or sister's kids, I will love you, feed you, clothe you, and even discipline you as if you are one of my own children. So it is with pleasure that I welcome my brother, Siona Havili, to Talks at Google. Awesome. Thank you so much, Doug. And thank you much, Google. Google, what's up? Thank you for having me. Uh, truly an honor. First and foremost, um, Go ahead and pull this up. Uh, it is truly an opportunity to uh, speak to everyone here this day. Uh, first and foremost, um, I'm often asked to speak uh, at youth detention centers and various places because of the pathway that I've taken within my life. I've made some decisions that altered my pathway, and ultimately, um, I, I had to take a pathway that... Um, that was very, very little traveled, if you will. Uh, so I'm extremely honored. Uh, as I had mentioned, I'm often asked to speak at podcasts or schools and tech companies. And so the opportunity to speak here at Google today uh, on behalf of Asian American Pacific Islander Month is truly a pleasure. Um, so with that said, I want to start with my heritage. Um, this month means a lot to me, primarily because not only am I Pacific Islander, but I am also of Japanese descent. Uh, my parents uh, are originally from Tonga. They both migrated here in the 1960s um, and uh, essentially established uh, a footprint here in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, I'm also of Japanese descent. My great grandfather on my father's side, his name is Otojiro Yamashita. He is originally from the Wakayama prefecture, an, improv an impoverished um, town known as Mirozu. Uh, he migrated to, to Tonga in 1923 with his brother and two cousins uh, as they worked for a company called the Bono Trading Company and were tasked with establishing um, uh, commerce there. Uh, he was there for about 14 years. Uh, he, he met my great-grandmother, had my grandmother, uh, and eventually moved back to Japan uh, in 1937. Sadly, four years later, uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed uh, by Japan and all of the uh, Japanese individuals that were located in the Pacific Islands were mandated to, to move back to the, to the uh, uh, and, and actually sent to internment camps in New Zealand. Uh, and so that's a little bit about my heritage and it certainly plays into my story, but I wanted all of you guys to know why I'm so passionate about this month 
and to be able to share my story today. So as I go through this story, I, I want to kind of start in the middle. Ten years ago, I found myself at a crossroads in my life. I graduated from Texas Tech University in 05. I had a couple solid years of work history on my resume, but I was struggling financially. So my wife and I decided that it was time for a change. I either was going to apply for law school, which had always been a passion of mine, or find a new career path. My other interest was in tech. And so there was a, a web analytics company known as Omniture uh, that had been acquired by Adobe here in Utah. It was the biggest tech acquisition here in Utah at the time, about $1.8 billion in 2009. Um, and there were rumors that they were going to break ground for a digital marketing headquarters in Lehigh, Utah. I had a friend that was employed at Omniture and he made some really, really good coin um, based on the stock that he owned. So naturally that piqued my interest as well. Uh, I found out that they were hiring three entry level sales reps otherwise known as BDRs or ADMs. So I threw my name in the hat. Unfortunately, the openings were not a secret. And there were hundreds of other applicants for those three positions. So my wife and I had a hard time trying to decide, although the law school route seemed like the best option, I was still intrigued by this tech opportunity. I still remember my Adobe interview like it was yesterday. Uh, if any of you guys have seen the movie Pursuit of Happiness, it was kind of like Chris Gardner's interview um, played by Will Smith. The only difference was is that I was wearing a shirt. And so in the room, there were three Adobe uh, VP or director level executives. And the first thing that they said to me was, sir, there are hundreds of, of applicants and there are only three up openings. So what separates you from everyone else? And it seems as if, as if they were trying to identify shortcomings as quickly as possible so that they could just get through all the candidates. Nervous and not sure what I was going to say, I paused for what seemed like an hour. I said, if you're looking for something wrong, you're gonna find more wrong in me than anyone else. The look on their faces was absolutely priceless, as, as I'm sure mine was as well, uh, since we were both equally surprised by what I said. And I wouldn't recommend any of you guys start an interview that, that way. But Adobe's Director of Business Development went on, went on to ask, what quite possibly could we find wrong in you that we haven't seen in anyone else? And I simply answered, I am a first degree convicted felon. And the room went completely quiet. And for the next 30 minutes, I proceeded to share the story that I'm gonna share with you all today. And as soon as I was done, he went up to executive office at, at San Jose and got approval to hire me. So if I didn't get your attention before, I sh I'm sure I do now. Um, so with that said, as a Tongan American, uh, being born and raised in Salt Lake City, Utah, naturally, my parents raised us to be extremely resourceful. Nothing in America was given to us. And so I was taught to work for everything that I had. Had a paper route at a very young age. We would recycle aluminum cans and newspapers for extra money. I had side hustles where I would mow the lawns and shovel the sidewalks of all the elderly individuals, you know, within a stone's throw away. And then also in the summertime, and we qualified for free lunch. And in my neighborhood, uh, all the local elementary schools uh, provided free lunch in the summertime. So my dad taught us that in order for us to be able to take advantage of that, to go to as many elementary schools that we could ride our bike to. And I was able to do that. I found out also in school, you know, that there was uh, kind of what you call an exchange program. There were individuals that, um, you know, that were you know, had food stamps and, and essentially I, there was a two for one trade ratio. And so with every money that I earned, I figured out that there was a way to be able to, to get that hustle on. And then as a Polynesian American, as most know, I was raised very heavy handed. I don't hold it against my dad. Um, you know, my mom was very loving, but that was, that was the only playbook that he knew. Right. And, and, and in addition to that, um, very God fearing people. I mean, if you look at the flag that I had showed on the initial slide, it exemplifies what Tonga is all about. Um, the cross uh, signifies the crucifixion of, of the Savior. The, the red on the flag is the blood and the white is the purity. And so that's something that is ingrained in us as Tongan Americans. But I had two sets of friends. Um, I had friends that aspire to do great things, go to college and do well in school. And then I had this other set of friends where I lived that all they wanted to do was to you know, make a name for themselves or put it down for the neighborhood, if you will. I was highly recruited to play football. I eventually, as Doug had mentioned, signed a letter of intent to play at BYU. But before enrolling at BYU, I decided to go on a Mormon mission. I, re I received an assignment to go to New York City. 
But between the time that I received my, my mission assignment and the time that I left, there was just an insurmountable amount of temptation from my friends. For the most part, I, I held pretty strong. But one fateful night in October of 1998, just a couple weeks before I was scheduled to leave, I let my guard down. And I made a decision that I still regret every single day. There was a drive-by shooting in my neighbor's house just around the corner. And regretfully, I was in involved in a retaliation to that drive-by. No one was injured on either side. But the decision to get involved that one night, decision that I regret every single day. Thankfully, as I mentioned, no one was hurt. But my friends had constantly warned me about. And that decision altered mine and, and all those forever. Now, regretfully, I didn't say a word. So after I ended up going on a Mormon mission, and after about a year and a half, I received a phone call from the Salt Lake City gang unit implicating me as the mastermind of a retaliation to that drive-by drive of an aggravated arson. The very next day, I was extradited straight home to, the Salt Lake, to Salt Lake City and sent straight to jail. Naturally, as a result, I lost my scholarship to BYU, and I had basically lost everything that I had worked for my entire life. That was the very first time that I had hit rock bottom. Imagine spending 16 to 18 hours a day confined to a six by eight foot concrete room. Just you and one other person. I was facing 15 years of life. It was a highly publicized case as a BYU football player, as a return Mormon missionary. They really wanted to throw the book at me. And there was no evidence. There was no witnesses. So after all my co-defendants, had accepted plea deals, miraculously, I was offered a plea deal that if I accepted a first degree felony, I would only be required to serve one year. In hopes of getting my life back on track, I gladly accepted that offer. Believe it or not, being locked up was one of the best experiences of my life because I chose to make it so. I leveraged all the resources that were afforded to me to make myself better. I, I liken my life to, or, or life to a card game. Right? We're all dealt different cards. Some of us have royal flushes. Other have not so great hands. But the measure of our lives are based on how we play our hand. I could have easily given up. threw my hand away. But I learned that they had offered classes and resources to give what they call good time, which means that for every class or job that you have or successfully complete, they will remove a certain amount of days off of your sentence. So I took every single class that I could, t that I could think of, Ar uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Anger Management. I even got a GED, even though I graduated from high school. And I served my time as even a jail librarian. And as a jailhouse librarian, one of the beauty of, of that role was, is I, would, I was outside a general population for six to eight hours a day. But most importantly, I had access to any and every single book within that jail. You often hear the phrase that when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. I decided to take it just a step further. And when life gave me lemons, I chose to eat, eat lobster tail. So after nine and a half months, I was released early. All the productive things that I was able to do while I was locked up. Uh, and upon my release, I ended up marrying my high school sweetheart. Bless her heart. She waited for me the entire time. Uh, and I ended up transferring to the University of Utah. Um, and... One of the requirements as you transfer from one college to the other is I had to sit out for an entire year. I had to prove myself out academically, and I ended up earning an, a 3.8 GPA. Felt like my life was back on track. Um, a month before the first game my freshman year, we were headed to Michigan, and I received word that I, the athletic director from the University of Utah had kicked me off the football team, and I was expelled from school because I was a first-degree felon. Thankfully... Local advocates, there was a lady named Fahina Basi of the National Tong and Irons uh, Honor Society and a very prominent local Japanese judge named Raymond Uno, who both rallied around the Tongan and Japanese communities on my behalf. I vowed from that day, regardless whatever would happen and the outcome, that I would validate their advocacy. And after a fruitless fight, I would say, at the University of Utah, my wife and I packed our stuff up. And we ended up moving to Inglewood, California, where I transferred to play at El Camino Junior College in Torrance. After a stellar year at El Camino, my first year back in pads after a four-year hiatus, I went through the recruiting process again. I accepted a scholarship at Texas Tech University, but as a 250-pound running back in a pass-first offense, I, don't, I didn't necessarily have the football career that I've always dreamed of. 
considering that in the first two games as a running back, on one side there was a gentleman named Wes Welker, and on the other side there was another guy named Danny Amendola. And in the quarterback room, there were guys like Cliff Kingsbury, Lincoln Riley, Graham Harrell, Sonny Cumbie, you name it. Um, but I was still extremely grateful um, that I was able to play football at that level, getting a free education, coming home every single night to my beautiful wife and, and, and daughter, Destiny. Going into my senior year, it felt like everything was going so well again. I graduated. I got my bachelor's degree early from Texas Tech, and I found out that my old football coach from the University of Utah had gotten a job at a, at a school called Weber State. And because I had graduated early, I decided to transfer and enroll in a master's program where I played football. As, it, as you've noticed in my journey, life never goes as planned. So week before the first game of my senior year, I was running the ball, uh, as I had done routinely in my career, many times uh, throughout lit Little League. And I had a collision with a linebacker, but this hit was different. As soon as I looked up, it felt like there was something in my left eye. And I blinked and I tried wiping it away but my vision was, was obstructed. And I could tell that there was panic on the face of the trainer. They ended up sending me to the alert or emergency room and come to find out at the age of 25 years old, I had a stroke uh, and, I, and I went blind in my left eye. I lost about 90% of, of my blindness. My football career was over. And my wife and I felt sorry for ourselves for about three days. And then we ended up dusting ourselves off, picking ourselves up and, and, and essentially, I had to make a living for my family. Um, as you can imagine, as a, as a convicted felon on the job market, it was extremely difficult. Um, I ended up starting a concert company uh, because I couldn't find jobs. And then I ended up finding a sales role selling investment education uh, after trying to sell cell phones and satellites. And I realized that in the sales profession, um, based on my performance, as long as I was bringing in revenue and I was a high performer, there were a lot of people that were turning a blind eye to, to my background. And essentially, as I go back to my background as a young Tongan kid in Glendale, Utah, I finally felt like, you know, sales was really a legal hustle. And that took me full circle to my uh, Adobe interview when I explained early on. So I'm often asked, did I ever find strength in persevering and overcoming so many hurdles in my life, despite, you know, facing all that ad adversity. And as I come to think about it, first of all, my parents, uh, they came here to America. They didn't speak the language. They ended up finding jobs. They ended up buying homes. Um, and certainly they were always there for me. And I've always wanted to be able to give back to them. Right. My dad always told me that if you go out there, I want you to make a difference and also my family. But the other thing is deep rooted in my heritage as a Pacific Islander. Um, I don't know if you guys know this. Pacific Islanders were innovators, right? They would navigate the open waters of the Pacific seas by the constellation of the stars, the temperatures of the waters and the currents. They were brilliant, right? Despite what everybody just thinks of them just being these warriors. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's what has been always part of my DNA and ingrained in me um, and it has motivated me. Now, uh, as Doug had mentioned, um, I, I'm, I'm an advocate. I'm an advocate for convicted felons because one of the things that they struggle with after they pay their debt to society is they have to try to find work to provide for themselves and their family. In this picture in the top left corner, this is an opportunity that I had earlier this year to testify in front of the Utah State Senate on behalf of a bill called SB 95, which protected employers uh, from liability if they decided to give people second chances. Before I testified, it actually had fallen flat and it didn't pass. And then because I was able to interview with, intervene with Senator Owens, thankfully it passed unanimously and uh, last month was signed by the governor here locally. Uh, in the top right corner, that's the prime minister of Tonga. Uh, his name is the Honorable Siausi Sovaleni. Uh, one of the neat things is, is he graduated from Oxford. He's a computer sciences major. And we ended up making a connection three or four years ago uh, in Hawaii uh, because we, we wanted to connect and figure out ways that we can up-level the people of Tonga in learning tech skills. Uh, and, and now he has become the full prime minister. And once they rebuild after uh, you know, the volcano, then we're going to work on doing some very neat things there and teaching the kids about coding. Um, I'm also passionate about, you know, helping Pacific Islanders, women, and underrepresented minorities in tech. 
Um, there are so many people that have been able to come and I've been able to help mentor them and create this network where we've been able to perpetuate this cycle. Uh, and it's definitely been a blessing, something that I'm really passionate about, something that I feel very passionate about paying it forward. Um, and in closing, before we kind of open it up, I, I want to just just set a couple closing thoughts with regards to my personal legacy um, as a Tongan Japanese uh, American here in the United States. Um, and I want to share it just by two stories because I think they exemplify and epitomize really what, what drives someone like me, right? First and foremost, this is a gentleman by the name of Bai Sikahama. If you don't know him, he is one of the first Tongans to play in the NFL. Um, and he ended up returning a kickoff. You can find it on YouTube, and he was punching the bag. Uh, and essentially, after his football career, he ended up getting a job with NBC10 in, in Philadelphia to become a news anchor. Well, um, 20 years into his new news anchor career, he ended up receiving a phone call from an agent of Jose Canseco. Jose Canseco is a former Major League Baseball player that was a home run hitter of, you know, of ages, and he was – going to start off his his fighting career and so essentially they reached out to Vice Gehema to ask if they could use him to kick off his boxing career sadly Vice Gehema told the agent I'm gonna win. he asked him why and he says because I'm Tongan and essentially the agent's like you don't understand Jose Canseco six foot four and a half he has every single black belt you can think of and at the end of the day Vi ended up mentioning to them that he's been through so many fights even with his dad, that there's nothing that Jose can say can do to beat him. I ended up asking Vi what his thoughts were, and he just mentioned it as, as a Tongan American. One thing is Pacific Islanders, our people historically travel to certain islands, right? And we talk about that warrioristic culture. And the first thing that they would do when they would find a new island is that they would land, they would do their war chant. And then, you know, what Vi had mentioned to me is they would burn their canoes. And the reason why they would do that is because the only way that they're getting off that island is if they conquer it. So that is the legacy of a Tongan, right? Secondarily, this is a picture of an unnamed Japanese boy. brother, And this was taken by a gentleman named Joe O'Donnell, who was, who was part of the U.S. military at the time. And it was captured in Nagasaki in 1945 after the nuclear bombing and Japanese surrender, uh, Japan surrender. And when the soldiers saw this young boy, they asked him to remove the dead child from his back so that the burden may be light. And he simply replied, he's not heavy. He's my brother. And if you look at his stature, he's very stoic. And all he cared about is that his, his brother would, respe would receive a, a respectful death. And so in closing, and my thoughts is that basically with my Tongan heritage, and Japanese heritage, not only is, am I blessed with this element, and I know all of you, all of you Tongans or Pacific Islanders are, that there's an element of fearlessness, but also that family comes before anything, that you would do anything to make sure that your mom, your dad, or your brothers or sisters are made whole. And uh, that is my message, and definitely appreciate the opportunity, Google, for, for being here today. And uh, I'll turn the, the time over to, to Doug and Daryl. Awesome. Well, Siane, what a powerful story and presentation. Thank you so much for being vulnerable and open, open to sharing your story with us. Um, I love the picture that you painted there at the end with Vaisi um, saying that there's no way that he's going to lose because he's Tongan. And then the young Japanese boy saying, he's not heavy, he's my brother. Both inspiring stories of determination, hard work, and love. Now, this month is Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And as you've alluded there, you come from rich heritage, not only from Tonga, but also from Japan. How has this heritage impacted you and how does it continue to influence your life? Yeah, the heritage, I think, is, you know, coming from societies like that, um, we've taught to be very collectivistic, um, meaning that we don't eat unless our family is able to eat, right? And that was something that was ingrained early on. I remember um, in high school uh, when we would gather around the lunch table with all of my fellow Tongans or Samoans or Polynesians, and some of us qualified for free lunch, some of us did not. And we knew that some of those that did not still didn't have the money for that. And so we would 
basically put all of our lunches in the middle and make sure that everyone could collectively, you know, be fed. And so that's just, I, I think that's just an example of, of things that, you know, for the most part, I think my parents would be upset if I didn't make sure that my brothers or my sisters were being fed uh, as well as I was in, in, in any capacity. And so that's where I think the heritage that you'd mentioned with those, those two pitchers, you know, lay a solid foundation with regards to that. I love that. It, it really puts into picture of the phrase, it takes a village to raise um, a, a kid. And so I appreciate that. Now, I, I've seen your documentary, very well done, um, and, and want to refer back to it. Uh, during the time you were incarcerated, uh, you became a trustee, which you alluded to earlier, which allowed you to work in the library. Now, in the documentary, the librarian talks about um, a story that she asked you a question. She said, are you sorry that you were caught? Or, um, you know, what if you had gotten off? Something to that effect, right? And you said something to her that she mentions that in the many, many years of working uh, with the jail system and working with over 70,000 inmates, she's never heard another inmate say this, which was, I need to be here. Um, I need to serve my time. I'd love to get your thoughts. Can you speak to that? Why did you feel that way? Uh, what did you need to learn from that experience? Yeah. Yeah, Wanda, she's sweet. Um, the premise behind that comment was just my mindset, you know, that there is a reward and a consequence to everything. And I had come to realize that many of my peers, there were always excuses why they were locked up or why they made the decisions that they did. And in reality, I wanted to make sure that I, I didn't take the stance that I was a victim. I was not a victim. I made a conscious decision to do what I did, but I wanted to make sure that I did everything that I could to make things right. And one of those things were, is I had to fully own up to my mistake. And in doing so, I knew that my time in there was necessary. And that's why, as I had mentioned, I did everything that I possibly could to make myself better despite the environment that I was in. Awesome. I love it. Um, I'll go ahead and ask one more question before we open it up to our audience. Um, this is an incredible story. Uh, we've covered it in a short 25 to 30 minutes. And the reality is that this took months and years of hardship, of struggles, of hitting rock bottom multiple times, maybe not always seeing the silver lining, maybe not always seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. One thing that we've learned through the pandemic and a word that we use a lot here at Google is resilience. How did you get through those tough times and show that resilience? What was the driving force through it all? Well, thankfully my family, um, my wife who was the girl, my girlfriend at the time when I was locked up was definitely extremely supportive. Uh, but there was a saying that always resonated with me from my football coach, his name's George Liz Kiko. Um, Kiko George was from East High School in Salt Lake City, and he always told us two things. Number one, you're either getting stronger, you're getting weaker, you're never staying the same. And that was uh, something that he shared with regards to the weight room, and I thought that was applicable to every, everyday life. The other thing that he would share with us is that you're either making excuses or you're making progress, but you can never do the same. And so when I found myself in that situation, I just wanted to do everything that I could to get my life back on track. Did I think it would turn out to what it is today? No, but I wanted to make sure that I could do whatever I could to, to honor my parents as them coming over from America, making sacrifices to raise me and my eight brothers and sisters to do right by them. And that was really my motivation. That's great. Um, let's go ahead and turn the time over to some of our questions from the audience. Um, let's ask, let's see the first one. First question is from Lynn. She says this, a few of us watching are recruiters or hiring managers. What advice do you have for us in terms of ensuring convicted felons are considered fairly for employment opportunities? Lynn, thank you for the question. First of all, I think it's important. Well, it's important for convicted felons to be upfront, right? Rather than just checking a box uh, while they're going through that interview process, um, I always recommend the ones that I mentor and teach to be very upfront, but also explain the things that they learned and the value based on those experiences that's going to bring your particular business. And, and naturally, Lynn, one of the things is, is, you know, there's the letter and there's the spirit. 
of the law. And so there's a, an opportunity for a recruiter to have that discernment. Is this person truly, you know, made, made, made a comeback in terms of the things that they've done and will they be an asset, uh, not only to my organization, but to the community. Awesome. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next question. Next question is from Sandeep. He says, uh, we cannot assume that all, all start the race from the same starting point. First chance also matters. How do we introduce adversity factor in college admissions, job interviews, et cetera? How do we introduce adversity factor in college admissions, job, job interviews? So this is a really interesting point. And Sandeep, thanks for asking. Um, one thing that, that I, I've always thought, right, and all of my peers that I know have this really linear pathway into their careers, into college. And unfortunately, people that come from very adverse backgrounds don't necessarily follow that path. And I'll, I'll just give you an example. Um, some of my peers, when we were growing up, you know, they either had to make a decision to class and, and go to practice or go to do what we call yate or yard work or, or construction work to help support their family. Um, when it comes to adversity, I think that there are things that can be learned based on experiences. One of my favorite movies is Slumdog Millionaire. And maybe it might be fictional, but the reason why I love that, that movie is because there were certain things that he had experienced throughout every, every facet and milestone of his life that helped him become successful at, at the pinnacle of that movie. And that's where I think that adversity and, and, and our backgrounds can certainly help facilitate and, and support those factions. So, Great, thank you for the question, Sandeep. Um, next question, please. The next question is from Kavika. He says, Malo toko, which means thank you, brother, in Tongan. Thanks for sharing your inspiring story. What are some challenges you face in guiding at risk youth to pursue higher education slash careers in tech? Kavika, malo apito. Uh, you know, really, I think it's just that dynamic, right? Is that in a collectivistic society, sometimes it's very difficult um, for Polynesian American parents to see that the sacrifice of you know going to college, going to school, that in the long run there's going to be sacrifices to allow and help contribute to the family later than than it than than now. Um, I remember this when I was going to college, right? My parents never made more than forty five thousand dollars a year, and although some of my peers when I was in school were receiving monies from their parents, you know, anytime that I would get um, my financial aid, I was figuring out ways to be able to contribute, you know, that back to, to, to my family, and so you know, helping set that expectation that the reason why our family has come here from Tonga to America is to make sure that we have a better life. And the pathway to doing that is, is certainly getting an education and, and set you up for a great career. Awesome. Thanks, Kavika, for the question. Uh, we'll move on to the, the next question. Sandy Bev has another question. He uh, states, what what you are really talking about is enhancing compassion with our Mekuan culture via embracing forgiveness and acceptance. What tools can families and institutions utilize to build that muscle? Yeah, Sandeep. So one of the ways of doing that, I think, is just sitting on the other side of the table. Uh, luckily for me, if I look at the pathway of my journey, there were so many people that had demonstrated that. First, the judge and the prosecutor in my case. I was facing 15 years to life. They ended up, you know, seeing that, you know, I would learn the same lesson, whether I was locked up for one year or 100 years. And so they ended up giving me that one year. I had a coach that, uh, although I had been kicked out from one school, was willing to take me on and happened to be a rival school and take on in all the inherent risks for me to do that. And then even at Adobe, all of these people along the way were able to sit on my side of the table, were able to wear my shoes and understand you know, the things that I could accomplish if I was given a second chance. And I don't think I'm an anomaly. I, I really think that there are a lot of people out there that all they need is a chance. They just need an opportunity to be able to tell their story. Awesome. We have uh, one more question we're going to go to, and then uh, we'll change uh, pages real quick. So last question here. 
Last question is pivoting off the last question. What advice do you have for others in your situation struggling to embrace their own past mistakes and move forward to a brighter future? Vera, thank you. Great question. You know, in reality, it can be extremely difficult, right? And I think we can be our own biggest critics. And one thing that I think is extremely important is the first thing that we need to do is just recognize we've made a mistake. And if, we, if we've taken the necessary steps to ask for forgiveness, to pay restitution, then at the end of the day, you know, we've made those mistakes and it, we need to allow ourselves to be able to move forward. And if we can't do that, no one else will give us that opportunity. Well, what a great way to wrap things up. Sienna, I want to give you the floor. Any last tips, uh, anything you would like to just share with the rest of us as we wrap things up? Yeah, so after I was hired at Adobe, my first um, interview for, for a new role was about a year and a half. I ended up telling my story that I told in my initial interview, and believe it or not, it was accepted uh, not as warmly. And the hiring manager told me not to do that anymore because it was a CLM. You know, I obviously learned later that that was a career limiting move according to his perception. I went home to my wife, um, didn't know where to go. And then I realized that at the end of the day, that that's what defined me. Um, even though I went through those experiences and I made a mistake, um, again, going back to what I had mentioned, everyone's pathway to success is not linear. Some of us have to take detours, but the beauty is, is we all have an opportunity to tell our own story. And if we tell that story, then we can definitely leverage that to be successful. And one other thing is, if you don't tell your story, somebody want out, some, somebody else will. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Yana. Appreciate you again sharing your powerful story. And thank you to the many who took time out of your day to attend Talks at Google. Again, I'm Doug Fiafia and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.